the anointing in the New Testament, and this teaching is for radical disciples in these very last days. Today, in most spirit-filled churches, we are told that there are supernatural anointings given to selected ministers. Among other things, these special anointings enable them to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to preach the word of God, to teach, to prophesy, and at one time, for gold teeth to appear in people's mouths during their services, even for diamonds to appear on the floor as they preach. And there are likely other such anointings available only to selected servants of God, in which when they minister, the supernatural happens. <clears throat> such manifestations can be sensational, and naturally they draw a lot of attention from the crowds. Uh, later, I will show a video. Now, the question is, are such anointings found in Scripture? We must examine the basis for such anointings, both in the New and the Old Testament. Are they supported in Scripture or not? <clears throat> As a teacher, I have chosen to be very conservative in interpreting and teaching scripture. If I err, if I make a mistake, it will be on the side of caution. That is my philosophy. Look at James 3 verse 1. Not many of you should be teachers, my fellow believers, because you will know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And so because of that, I'm very conservative. Let us therefore first examine the instances of the words anointed, anointing, or anoint in the New Testament of the New International Version, the NIV. <clears throat> Our purpose will be to determine whether or not current understanding of the anointing in the church today is consistent with New Testament scripture, which of course is inspired, inerrant, and authoritative. Let's now begin. Now the following search was taken from Vine's dictionary. So the word anointing is found in 1 John 2 verse 20. And it says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Now, you, of course, refers to us, all believers. It refers to all believers. This, therefore, refers to an anointing for all believers to know the truth. That is very clear. You refers to us, all believers. Therefore, this is not a special anointing on a certain servant of God to minister supernaturally to others. <clears throat> Rather, this anointing ministers to all of us by teaching us to know the truth. Now, another instance of this word anointing is found in 1 John 2, 27. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you. And you, of course, refers to us, all believers. And you do not need anyone to teach you, you referring to all believers. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, again, this refers to an anointing received by all believers and this anointing teaches us about all things. So this does not refer to a special anointing given only to some ministers to minister to others supernaturally. No, this is an anointing received for received by all believers. 
This anointing teaches all believers, all believers, including all of us. Now, so we conclude that every believer has this anointing to be taught by the Holy Spirit about all things. Every believer. So is it the Lord's will, therefore, that we believers remain forever dependent on fallible servants of God to teach us, such that we never fully mature in Christ? Is that God's will? for us to remain forever dependent. Of course, in the beginning, yes, as new believers, we need to be taught. We need to have teachers. But is this to be forever so that we never mature in Christ, so that we never study the scriptures for the Holy Spirit to teach us, and thus we fully mature in Christ? Now, this again is a consequence of the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, Paul says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. We are told to do our best to be a good worker, a good worker who correctly handles the word of truth. Uh, excuse me for just a moment. <clears throat> okay, I'm back. Now let's go on. Here is another instance of the word anointed. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 21. Now, it is God who makes us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us and you. Us means us and you. He anointed us and you set his seal of ownership on us and you, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. This, of course, refers to all believers being anointed as a seal of God's ownership on us, meaning on all believers. <clears throat> This does not refer to a special anointing given only to some leaders to minister to others supernaturally. No, this is an anointing for all believers. Now, the above three instances are the only instances in the New Testament of believers having an anointing or being anointed. That's it. That is it. These are the only instances in the New Testament of believers being anointed. Notice that this anointing actually and specifically ministers to us believers. It teaches us about all things and seals us as God's holy possession, guaranteeing for us what is to come. This anointing is for all of us. And the above three instances, again, are the only instances in the New Testament of believers being anointed. This anointing, therefore, is not meant to enable us or some selected servant of God to minister to others in some special supernatural way. No, not according to the New Testament. Now, for other instances of the words anointed, anointing or anoint in the New Testament. Let's go on. Okay, we see here, uh, just a moment, please. Uh, just a moment. Okay, now, another instance of the word anointing that we find in the New Testament, Hebrews 1. I believe it's verse 9. But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. So the scripture is talking about the Son, meaning Jesus Christ. And ver this verse also calls him, O God, O God. So obviously, this verse is referring to 
our Lord Jesus Christ alone. Verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So the one being anointed here is obviously Jesus Christ himself. This refers specifically to the anointing of joy on Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, to no one else. Again, Hebrews here does not talk about a special anointing given to some servant of God to minister to others supernaturally. No, it refers to the anointing of joy on Jesus Christ himself. Okay, another instance of the word anointed. This is taken from Mark chapter 6, verse 13. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Now, this refers to physically anointing or physically rubbing oil on sick people. That's what it refers to. It is not a special anointing given only to some ministers for healing the sick. No, this is simply physically anointing sick people with oil, rubbing oil onto them. Another instance of the word anointed, Luke 4, verse 16, is where it is found. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So obviously this refers to our Lord Jesus Christ. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Meaning? on me, Jesus Christ, because he has anointed me, meaning Jesus Christ, to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed. Therefore, these verses clearly refer specifically to the anointing only on Jesus, the Messiah, to preach, to set prisoners free, to heal the blind and to release the oppressed. Another instance of the word anointed is founded in Acts chapter 4, verse 26. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one, or against his Christ. Here, the anointed one is clearly Jesus, the Son of Man, and not some special servant of God anointed to minister to others supernaturally. This clearly refers to Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. Another instance of anointed is found in Acts 4, verse 27. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. Now here it is very clear that Jesus, the Son of Man, is the one who is anointed to save and deliver us. Jesus is the one who is anointed. Not some disciple or specially chosen servant of God anointed to minister to others. No. The one who is anointed here is Jesus only. Another instance of the word anointed is found in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So who is the one being anointed here? It's Jesus, the Son of Man, the one who was anointed with the Holy Spirit to do good and to heal all who were under the power of the devil, that is, to save us. Jesus is the one who was anointed, not some servant of God in our midst. No, no, no. This refers to Jesus only. Another instance of the verb anoint, Mark 16, verse 1, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. 
This refers, of course, to Jesus's physical body being anointed with spices in preparation for his burial. Again, it does not refer to a special anointing given only to some servants of God to minister to others supernaturally. No, no, no. Another instance of the verb anoint is found in James 5, verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. This refers to physically anointing or rubbing sick people with actual oil. It is not a special anointing on some servant of God to minister supernatural healing to others. No. Rather, any elder can physically anoint the sick with oil and pray over him or her. Now, we have just examined all the instances of the words anointing, anointed, and anoint, which are found in the New Testament of the New International Version of the Bible. Let's make some conclusions now. Conclusion number one. Popular usage of the words anoint, anointed, and anointing in the church today, referring to special servants of God who can bless or minister to others supernaturally, is not supported by the New Testament, not supported by New Testament scripture. Yes, Jesus, the anointed one, lives in us, absolutely. But scripture never teaches that we are anointed to minister to others as only the Son of Man could. Scripture never says that. Only Jesus is anointed to save and to heal and to deliver. Instead of anointing, Scripture teaches us that we believers have been given supernatural authority and supernatural power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit to minister to others supernaturally. Yes, that's what the Bible says we have been given. Supernatural authority and power to cast out all demons and to cure diseases and the gifts of the Holy Spirit to minister to others within the body of Christ. Yes, Luke 9, verse 1, when Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And also, of course, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 6, which speaks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit given to us to minister to one another within the body of Christ. Verse 6 says, there are different kinds of working, meaning supernatural working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, meaning each one in the body of Christ, the manifestation of the Spirit, meaning the gifts, is given for the common good. So, Scripture clearly tells us that, yes, we have been given supernatural authority and power to cast out all demons and to heal the sick in the context of proclaiming the kingdom of God as well as the gifts of the Holy Spirit to minister to other members of the body of Christ in a supernatural fashion. Yes, absolutely. But scripture does not say that we have been given the anointing to minister to others as only Jesus could and did. Now, conclusion number two, proper usage of these words in terms of the anointing to minister to others supernaturally applies to one person alone in the New Testament, and that is the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Only one, only one who is anointed to minister to others, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. He alone was anointed to save, to deliver, and to heal. Let me share with you a few observations that I have found in the New Testament, that I have observed in the New Testament. Number one, pseudo Christos or false Christ or false anointed ones occurs twice. Creo or anointed occurs five times. Okay, Creo is the Greek word for to anoint, Anointed occurs for five times. Now look at this. Four times, Jesus is the one anointed. Four times, Jesus is the one anointed. 
one time, all believers are anointed. All believers, not just some, but all believers are anointed as God's possession. Therefore, in the New Testament, the word anointed is used to refer only to either Jesus or to all believers, never only to a certain subset of special leaders or special pastors or special servants of God. No. In the New Testament, who is anointed? Yes, either Jesus or all believers. Of course, anointed in a different way, as we shall see later. That is it as far as the word anointed in the New Testament. That is it. Now, chrisma, the noun chrisma or anointing, occurs only three times in the New Testament, and it refers to all believers having the anointing, all believers having the anointing, that is, to be taught by the Holy Spirit and to know all things. That is the anointing that we see in the New Testament, and it has been given to all believers. There are no specially anointed servants of God. No, no, no. So could false Christs or false anointed ones refer to those who claim to be anointed to minister supernaturally today? Is that possible? Because Jesus says there will be many false Christs, false anointed ones, false prophets. Could those be the ones who claim to have an anointing to minister to others? Christ literally means anointed, as we have seen during our last session. Christ means anointed. Anointed to do what exactly? Well, anointed to save us. That's what Christ came to do, to save us. Anointed means anointed to save us. The Greek word for save is soto. The word sozo includes not only saving from sin, but also to deliver or protect, to heal from sickness, to preserve, to save, to do well, to be or make whole. That's what the word save means. And only Jesus was anointed to save us in this way, meaning to save us from sin and hell, to heal from sickness, to preserve, to save, to make whole. Only Jesus was anointed and consecrated to the messianic office, furnishing him with powers necessary for its administration. Only Jesus was anointed in that way. No man, no servant of God is anointed to save us and heal us and deliver us as only Jesus, the Son of Man, was. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Authority and power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are separate and distinct from anointing. Please do not confuse supernatural authority and power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit with anointing. They are separate and distinct. <clears throat> Therefore, the New Testament does not at all support the existence of a special anointing on any servant of God or leader to minister supernaturally to others. No, it does not. Now, here's a caveat that I would like to share with you before I go on. Most servants of God who believe in the anointing, meaning in the popular fashion, they do so innocently without really understanding what New Testament scripture actually teaches about it. Such servants of God, and there are many, are simply parroting what they have heard from popular teachers about the anointing. They are not necessarily false prophets, no. I believe they are innocent. They are just parroting what they heard from popular teachers. They may simply have been deceived, as Jesus warned in Matthew 24, verse 5. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the anointed, and will deceive many. So I believe most servants of God who believe in this anointing, yeah, they are counted among those who have been deceived. They are not necessarily the false prophets, which Jesus speaks about. 
However, as Jesus warned, there are definitely false prophets or false Christs or false anointed ones who claim that they are anointed and they will use it to draw crowds to their meetings, thus growing personal fame and wealth, and they can impart their anointing to those who give generously to their ministry. You know, there is a saying in which I believe, and that is, just follow the money. Just follow the money. Now, there is a practice called grave sucking, which was very controversial several years ago. And uh, many of you perhaps have never heard of it, but some of you perhaps have. Some have taught that this anointing can be received through a practice called grave sucking. What is grave sucking? Grave sucking is a practice on which if we want the anointing, we have to go to the grave of a servant of God, <clears throat> excuse me, a servant of God who was known to be anointed and who has gone home to the Lord. We go to his gravesite and we lie, we lay ourselves on top of his grave in order to suck up the anointing from his remains, which are in the grave. This is called grave sucking. Now, let me read to you the following. It's taken from an article written by Pastor Albert Kang of Faithline Ministries in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And the title of this article is, Is Grave Sucking Biblical? Okay. This is what Pastor Albert wrote. Benny Hinn is a firm believer of grave sucking when he openly shares what happened when he visited the grave of Amy Simple McPherson, the founder of Four Square Church. This is what Benny Hinn wrote. I felt a terrific anointing when I was there. I actually, I, I, I hear this, I trembled when I visited Amy's tomb. I was shaking all over. God's power came all over me. Benny Hinn goes on to say, I believe the anointing has lingered over Amy's body. I know this may be shocking to you. <laughs> and I'm going to take David Palmquist and Kent Maddox and Cheryl Palmquist this week. They're going to come with me. You, you, you're going to feel the anointing at Amy's tomb. It's incredible. And Catherine's, meaning Catherine Coleman's tomb. It's amazing. I've heard of people healed when they visited the tomb. They were totally healed by God's power. You say, what a crazy thing. Brother, there's things we'll never understand. Are you all hearing me? So Benny Hinn is sharing what happened when he did grave sucking at the tomb of Amy Semple McPherson and also at the tomb, I believe, of Catherine Kuhlman. Although he has tried to deny it, grave sucking is also associated with Bill Johnson of Bethel Church in Redding, California. Bill Johnson is quite a well-known preacher uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ, Bill Johnson. The following photos show Bethel church people engaged in grave sucking. Here you see Bethel people. They are lying on the top of the uh, tombstone of Mary Woodworth Edder. You may have heard of her, a very well-known servant of God who died in 1924. Mary Woodworth Edder. They are lying on top of her grave in order to suck up the anointing from her bones. Here you have Bethel people laying hands on someone else's gravesite, hoping to suck up the anointing from the remains of that deceased servant of God. Here you have, I believe it is a sister from Bethel, hugging the tombstone of Charles Finney, hoping to suck up the anointing from his remains, 
from his bones. And you here you have a sister lying on top of the yeah, grave of another servant of God. I don't know who that is. Let's let's look at this. Let's listen to this. Uh, they are sucking up the anointing at the grave of Smith Wigglesworth here. Okay. Soaking up the anointing of past revivalists. Yeah, dead guys. So here we are at Smith Wigglesworth's grave um, in Bradford. It's up the, the other end of England. You might not be able to come here naturally, but you can certainly feel it supernaturally what's happened in this man's life. And it's funny, all of us students, when we came here, the thing that we felt was uh, that, like the raising of the dead power and the gift of faith came on us. And some students were looking mm. at the back of the grave and felt a grace and a faith just rest on them. It's funny, isn't it? How, you know, Elisha, um, I think someone put the, the, bo the person's bones on his bones and they got raised up to life. When you come into a place where the Holy Spirit was on a person, he still exists there. He still keeps the heritage of the person's life. And here you can see how his whole family buried with him. Um, but this is the man, Smith Wigglesworth. And, and the history of this man is a history of miracles and great faith and a restoration of the miraculous anointing into the Church of England and also across the whole world. And as you know, he's written many great books and writings on, on gifts of faith and, and the working of faith and the working of miracles. He even punched people at times, and uh, which I don't encourage all the time. But when the gift of faith comes on you, and you know what to do. You've got to punch that devil out of people. And smack that thing in the chops and get it out of someone's life and get the devil off people's back. And this is what this man did. And so although you can't be here in the natural, just open up your hands right now and get ready to receive in the spiritual because there's Come no on. distance in the spirit. Yeah. And God can release this same impartation onto you. And just before we do that, we're just going to, uh, I'm going to show you one scripture down here that has on his grave an amazing scripture they put on his grave here just after his writings there about Smith Wigglesworth's life. They put this, he says, I fought the good fight and I've kept the faith. This man had an enduring spirit. And I believe right now the impartation is going to be the gift of faith is going to come on you. And also the spirit of endurance. That this man, he was persistent. This man prayed in tongues for two to three hours a day, read the Bible every day. And he kept the faith all, all the way up to the end of his life. And out of all the people in the God's General's books, he's one of the ones that he never fell, he never compromised, he never changed his heart and his attitude toward God and toward people. He stayed the same and he had enduring faith. And so we're just going to pray right now in Jesus' name. So we release, we release, other students want to come in, we just release over the, over the camera right now. We just okay. release the anointing. Okay, we're going to go on because I don't think we need that anointing, all right? Now, T.B. Joshua had the anointing of 10,000 pastors. I'm sure you've heard of him, a very well-known preacher from Nigeria. He had the anointing of 10,000 pastors. Let me read to you something taken from the Premium Times this month, July 2021, that T.B. Joshua was one of Nigeria's controversial yet revered preachers, was never in doubt. Charismatic, yet somewhat mystical, especially to his critics. Mr. Joshua had an uncommon feat, or as some would say, an uncommon power. It was his miracles and an influence that extended far beyond the shores of Nigeria. In fact, he could be likened to that prophet who wasn't respected at home. This was because congregants who thronged his Lagos church were predominantly foreigners. The church's neighborhood also became a tourist haven because of the influx of persons seeking miracles, including heads of government, celebrities, and football stars. But let me share with you the experience of one person. I cannot pronounce his name. But let me read it. On the 9th of October, 2014, while in this spirit, I and many others began praying in the fire of the Holy Ghost. I was then taken to another scene where I saw Prophet T.B. Joshua praying on the thought of low-minded persons. I saw how he took away their glory. Words cannot fully explain the illustration of what I saw, but the Spirit of God helped me with its understanding. By praying on their weak mind, zooming away their stars and destiny like an enchantment i was with a lady in the spirit who was left confused after an encounter with the so-called so-called man of god 
And then I saw the level of satisfaction this gave him as he drove to his car, because all this was for his own upliftment and glory. T.B. Joshua is nothing but a false prophet who walks on the mind of weak believers and miracle seekers. And of course, as you know, he recently passed away just earlier this year. T.B. Joshua. I believe he is one of the false prophets who has deceived many. Let's look at the Toronto Blessing founded by John and Carol Arnott. Now, this took place over 20 years ago in the 1990s. Uh, the following was taken from an article which they shared on the internet. In September of 1992, when an evangelist came to town with a very anointed ministry, and as I have mentioned earlier, uh, there are no such ministries today according to the New Testament. Carol and I knew we needed to attend his meetings. What we saw there jarred us into remembering that we have a very big God who is able to save, to heal, and deliver. The lame walked, the blind received their sight, deaf ears were opened, and about 10, excuse me, 1,000 people came to Christ. So, of course, we know that miracles are associated with the anointing. Yes, we fell in love with Jesus all over again. Powerfully touched by the experience, we said to God, that's what we want, Lord. That's what we want. As we prayed for God's direction, we felt him say, if you are serious, I want you to do two things. Commit your mornings to prayer and interact with others who are anointed. We were serious, meaning they were desperate for this anointing. So in October 1992, we canceled our engagements and we began giving our mornings to the Lord in which they sought desperately after this quote unquote anointing. We worshiped, we read the Bible, we prayed and spent time with him for a year and a half. So they earnestly sought the Lord for this quote unquote anointing. We fell in love with Jesus all over again. We also invited guest speakers to our church. Their denominational affiliation did not matter to us. If we heard they were anointed and used by God, we wanted them to come hoping we could learn from them. So here we see John and Carol were very hungry, very thirsty, were desperate for this quote unquote anointing which we have seen is not biblical. A real breakthrough came a year later. We heard about the revival in Argentina. And so we traveled there in November, 1993 with Ed Silvo. So hoping some of it would rub off on us. Anointing would rub off on us. Carol, who, all, who always received from God easily was so powerfully touched by the spirit she could not walk. I had always had a more difficult time receiving. At one point, Claudio singled me out and said, do you want the anointing? Which, as we have seen, is not found in the New Testament. Oh, yes, I want it all right, I answered. Then take it. He slapped my outstretched hands. I will take it, I said. Something clicked in my heart at that moment. It was as though I heard the Lord say, for goodness sake, will you take this? Take it, it's yours. And I received more of the Holy Spirit's anointing and power by faith. Again, the Holy Spirit's anointing to perform miracles is not found in the New Testament, not found as far as believers are concerned. Here is my conclusion. If you seek after the anointing with all of your heart, just like John and Carol Arnott did, you might actually receive it. That's what happened to them. They actually received this anointing, and the rest is history. It's called the Toronto Blessing. But there may be a price to pay. How do you know it is really from the Lord? 
it is not biblical, is it really from the Lord? It is not in accordance with what scripture teaches. But if you seek after it with all of your heart, you might receive it. But receive it from whom? That is a good question. Matthew 24, verse 4, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the anointed and will deceive many. Matthew 24, 24, For false anointed ones and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That's you and me. And with this false anointing, yes, some servants of God have been able to perform great signs and wonders, and I believe they have succeeded in deceiving many, even among the elect, that is you and me. Now, this was taken from a website called Lighting the Darkness. I went to a meeting last week which left me feeling really odd. My sister wanted me to go to experience what she called a new move of the spirit, so I eagerly attended the meeting. People were falling over, laughing, laughing so hard they couldn't stand up or do anything but double over in hysterics. I don't want to judge this movement. I don't want to limit God, but if this is the Holy Spirit, why do I feel so spooked out? And then the article goes on to say, The so-called Toronto Blessing, or the Laughing Revival, which is currently tickling the ears of many thrill-seeking Christians, and this article is from several years ago, by the way, is one of the newest of a series of false signs and wonders deceiving many who are purport purportedly seeking God. All right, again, this article uh, originated several years ago. But there are those who are really seeking God, and then they discover these false signs and wonders, and so they end up being deceived, because miracles are very convincing. Of course, the Toronto blessing is now over. It's now over, okay? I'd like to play with you a video, and the title is False Spirits Invade the Church Through a False Anointing. It's called Kundalini Warning. Okay. Let's look at this 10-minute video. I believe it will be worth our time. Hmm. I'm sorry, it's not working. Okay. Uh, excuse me just a moment. Okay. Excuse me just a moment. Excuse me just a moment. Okay. Let me work on this. Uh, Okay, I think I will have to share this video next time because right now it is not working. I'm so sorry about that. So sorry. Okay, let me go on. I will share it the next time. Anyway, that video is a very eye opening video. It's showing what happens during some services, for example, at Bethel Church, when the anointing comes upon the people. Uh, you will see in this video certain manifestations, and they resemble manifestations that you find when the Kundalini spirit comes upon people in India. Okay, For example, you look on the left here, you see the manifestations which take place during meetings of people in India who receive this Kundalini spirit. What you see 
is you see singing, you see reciting mantras, you hear about animal sounds, people are trembling, shaking, yoga postures, waves of bliss, elation, altered consciousness, aches, anxiety, feeling of heat flashes, okay? And you see the same manifestations in meetings of the Toronto Blessing. You see inspired singing, uh, supposedly in the spirit. Uh, you see other inspired utterances, okay? But it is conceivable that while yogis recite mantras, the Christians are manifesting something more typical to them as Christians. Uh, you will hear animal sounds at the Toronto Blessing. You will see people trembling, people shaking, strange postures you will see laughter euphoria prophetical glimpses pain weeping crying feelings of heat or cold in the body these are things that we will see in manifestations of in the toronto blessing now again toronto blessing is over but this is what was witnessed okay now let me give you a preview for our next session Okay, a preview. And at that next session, I will make sure that you get a chance to see the video. At our next session, we are going to study the anointing in the New Testament. Okay, the anointing in the New Testament. Now, here's a preview. There are instances of an anointing in the Old Testament which enabled Israelite kings to lead their people to victory over their enemies in the Old Testament, and by which priests and prophets ministered to God's people. So in the Old Testament, uh, there was an anointing on priests and prophets, and of course, kings. This kind of anointing, however, is limited strictly to the Old Testament. Anointed kings, anointed priests, and anointed prophets in the Old Testament were all shadows and types, all of which have now been fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he is the King of Kings. He is our great high priest. He is the prophet. The Old Testament anointings on kings, priests, and prophets have been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Son of Man, is the only one in the New Testament who is anointed to save, to heal, and to make whole. Now, what happens when New Testament believers seek after anointing to minister to others? What happens? By the way, and that kind of anointing is found only in the Old Testament. What happens? Well, let's to understand what would what might happen to us in the New Testament. Let's take a quick look at some prominent anointed figures in the Old Testament. We're going to look at King Saul, King David and King Solomon, three very well known anointed kings of Israel in the Old Testament. Now we know that all three of them started out well leading the Israelites, witnessing great victories and blessings from the Lord. Yes, in the beginning. David and Solomon in particular were also personally intimate with the Lord. You recall David was the man after God's own heart. But eventually all three fell into sin near the end of their lives. All three of them fell into sin, even David and Solomon. And when they did, of course, they displeased the Lord. These three anointed kings fell into sin near the end of their lives. Now, the question is, how could this be? How is it possible that these three kings who were anointed, they had a real, true anointing from the Holy Spirit, how could they sin and displease the Lord? now we will see at our next session so i invite you to join us a week from today at our next session to find out how is it possible that these three anointed kings could fall away could fall could sin now of course david did not fall away david's sin was forgiven but he did sin and he brought 
great trials and tribulation upon his father, excuse me, upon his family because of his sin, even though he was forgiven. So please join us at our next session. Now, let's look at the cherub Lucifer, who, unlike us human beings, was created absolutely perfect. All right? When he was created, he was perfect. Now, of course, we are not perfect, but he was created perfect, and he was a cherub, a supernatural being. He was anointed by God, as we shall see in a moment. What happened to him? Well, let's see. Ezekiel 28, verse 15. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created. You were the anointed cherub that covers, and I had put you in the holy height of God where you were. So, Lucifer was anointed. Perfect since the way, since the day he was created, and he was anointed. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty. And where did he get that beauty? Because he was anointed. And you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. Because Lucifer was anointed, beautiful and splendorous he eventually became proud even though he was created perfect but he eventually became proud and as we shall see from isaiah 14 at our next session he wanted to make himself like the most high he wanted to make himself like god he wanted to be god And so he fell from heaven. Now we know him as Satan. In the beginning, Satan was anointed, created perfect. But what happened to him? He became proud because of that anointing. He fell from heaven, and now he is Satan. Amazingly, even the perfect creature Lucifer could not resist the pride that comes from being anointed. How about you and me? We are not perfect. Do you think you could resist the pride that comes from being anointed? Similarly, Saul, David, and Solomon were unable to resist the pride that comes from being anointed by God such that everything they set their hand to was successful. Because of God's anointing upon them, whatever they did was successful. Victory after victory after victory, accomplishment after accomplishment after accomplishment. It was because of the anointing. Everything they did was blessed and fruitful and successful. But as a result, they became proud. And they began to take God for granted doesn't matter what I do. God loves me. God will bless me. I'm his anointed. You know the saying, touch not God's anointed. <laughs> and so, since I'm anointed, God will not touch me. No one can touch me. I can do whatever I want. No one can touch me. God loves me. God has anointed me. God will bless me. I'll do whatever I want. They began to take God for granted. Do you think that could happen to you and me? they ended up no longer fearing God and so eventually sinned against him. Could it be that the Old Testament anointing to perform supernatural feats as coveted by some servants of God today is not meant for imperfect, fallible human beings? Is that possible? It's not meant for us. It's not meant for us. Could it be that it is reserved for deity alone, that is, our Lord Jesus Christ? That is exactly what we see taught in the New Testament. 
our Lord Jesus Christ is the only one in the New Testament scripture who is anointed to save, to heal, to make whole, to restore, and to preserve. He is the only one. He is deity. He is the only one who can take having the anointing. Let us therefore think twice about coveting this anointing. Think, think twice, please. Perhaps it is not meant for us. Scripture teaches that we have already been given supernatural power and authority over disease and demons to be used in proclaiming the kingdom of God very fruitfully to the lost. That's in, according, in accordance with Luke 9, verses 1 and 2, Luke 10, verse 9. We have the supernatural power and authority. We have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But remember, they are separate and distinct from the anointing. We do not need to covet the anointing. What God has given us is enough. Do not covet something which God does not promise to give us according to the New Testament. But if you choose to seek after the anointing, do so at your own risk. I, for one, I do not covet the popular anointing often taught in the church today. No, I do not want it. I do not ask for it. I don't seek it. I do not want it. I don't want this anointing that produces sensational miracles to draw the crowds and their offerings. No. Rather, I am most content having the biblical anointing from the Holy Spirit to know and to understand the Word of God and to be anointed with the seal of God's ownership on me. I am most content having that. At our next gathering, a week from today, we will examine in detail the anointing in the Old Testament. And if I can get that video working, I will show that video as well. Next week, the anointing in the Old Testament. Now, praise the Lord, I have finished sharing. And now I would like to minister to uh, one person who needs healing just to get the ball rolling. And after that, I will leave and enjoy breakfast with my beautiful wife. By the way, our two daughters and their children are with us. So we have three little children with us. <laughs> so our house is full. So I'm going to enjoy breakfast in a moment, but first, uh, let us minister to some people who need healing. Uh, is there someone there who has carpal tunnel syndrome? That is, you have pain in your wrist and you cannot move it freely. I'd like to minister to you. Or if there was someone with a back problem, uh, I'd be happy to minister to you as well. Okay. So, uh, Pastor David, uh, you can take over and find such a person to for me to minister to if there is such a person. Yeah, is there anyone here? Jocelyn Men Key. Pastor William mentioned, right? Jocelyn Key has raised her hand. Okay, yeah, let's please, focus. Please okay. indicate yourself, or you can put a sign. Okay, there she is. Okay, Jocelyn, uh, can you okay. unmute yourself? Unmute yourself so I can hear you. Okay. Uh, okay. My, my, my back here, my shoulder, and down to my spine, to the tip of my spine. Okay. That means from my neck down, my neck is giving problem ah. to the tip of my spine, L4 okay. and L5. So all the way to your tailbone, correct? Yes, yes, that's right. So I okay. can't, I can't sit long. I have to, like, you know, uh, get up. Okay, so you have difficulty getting up because of that pain, correct? No, I had to get up because I see too long the pain. Oh. It impresses on L four and L five. I see, I see. Do you feel the pain right now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we will minister to you. And after that, I want you to test yourself. Tell me, is there any change? Tell me, has the pain left? 
because we expect a miracle. We expect the pain to obey us because the pain is under our authority. When we command it to go, we expect it to go. And so, of course, I will ask you, is the pain gone? Do you feel better? Okay. Now, uh, let me ask you, uh, are you a believer? Yes, of course you are. <laughs> yes. So uh, we have to make sure that you, as a believer, we have to make sure that you have no bitterness or unforgiveness in your heart. Okay. That's very important. Uh, make sure no bitterness, no unforgiveness yeah. against other people. Okay. Good, good. Very good. Now, so we are going to, are you all by yourself, Jocelyn? Is there anyone yeah. there with you? Yes. You're all by yourself. Okay. So in I that case, outside and he he's outside okay in that case i will ask you to lay hands he's not a christian okay good good uh i'm going to ask you to lay hands on yourself later because when you when we lay hands on the sick the bible teaches that the lord's healing power flows and typically we lay hands on other people but since you're the only one there then we are forced to have you lay hands on yourself okay so later you will lay hands on yourself wherever you have that pain. And then we are going to issue commands in the name of Jesus. I am going to rebuke the pain and I am going to command your spine to be correctly aligned in Jesus name. OK, and you repeat those commands after me. In fact, I would like everyone to repeat those commands after me. And when we when we repeat them, we repeat them with authority and with no doubt this infirmity is like a, a dog it is under our authority it must obey our commands now but our dog our dog will obey us because our dog is obedient but this infirmity is in rebellion to god it wants to stay so we have to force it out in jesus name all right okay are you ready uh do you believe that jesus is going to heal you now Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. As a believer, you must believe. <laughs> good. Hallelujah. Now, unbelievers do not have to believe, but believers must believe. Okay. Unbelievers only believe after they are healed, <laughs> but believers are accountable to God. Therefore, before they receive, they must believe. Okay, good. So now let's go. Uh, lay hands on yourself where, wherever you can. Can you do that now? Okay. Yes. Okay, you do that. Now, you don't have to close your eyes because we are not praying, but we are going to fight this enemy. So it's better if you keep your eyes open. When you fight your enemy, do you close your eyes? <laughs> no. no, no, never, right? You keep your eyes wide open. So uh, we're going to attack this infirmity. So keep your eyes open because you're going to attack, okay? You're not praying, you're attacking. You're going to punch this thing in the face. You get it? Because you hate this thing, don't you? It tortures you, right? So I want you to be, I want you to have holy anger. Good, good. Okay, here we go. Ready? Okay, good. Repeat this after me. Eyes open. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Name of Jesus Christ. Uh, you too, Jocelyn. Repeat it after me. In the name of Jesus. In the, in name, the, name, of in the name of Jesus. I rebuke this pain. I leave now in Jesus' name. Leave now, now in Jesus' name. Any spirit of infirmity, go in Jesus' name. Any spirit of infirmity, go in Jesus' name. Spine be totally realigned in Jesus' name. Spine be completely realigned in Jesus' name. Spine be straightened now in Jesus' name. Spine be strengthened in Jesus' name. All nerves be released in Jesus' name. All nerves be released in Jesus' name. Now be healed. Now be healed. Okay, more authority. I want more authority now. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed, be healed in Jesus' name. No more pain. No more no pain. More pain. Okay, Jocelyn, try it out. Stand up, try it out. Move around in Jesus' name. Okay, let's wait for a second. Let's wait for the feedback. Okay. Now, how do you feel? Is there any change? Yeah, my 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 L4, L5 better. 
better. But okay. My neck here. Okay. Still painful here. Okay. All right. Good. So the mountain has begun to move. Good. You are feeling better. Okay. Let's speak to the mountain again. Okay. Put put your hand back where it was. Put your hand back there. Now. Let's let's get angry with this. Okay, Jocelyn. I want you to get angry. You don't like yeah. this thing, right? You you want to fight this thing. You want to drive this thing out, correct? Okay. I want you to get angry when you give these commands, okay? This is like an enemy attacking you. You have to fight back. You have to punch back, right? Okay? Now, repeat these commands with authority. In the name of Jesus. In the name, the name of, Jesus. of Jesus. All pain leave now. All pain, All pain leave now. now. Upper spine be straightened now. Spine be straightened, be straightened now. 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 Totally straightened now in Jesus name. Totally straightened now in Jesus name. Spine go back into place in Jesus name. Spine, spine. go back into place in Jesus name. Spine. 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 Nerves released in Jesus name. No, no, no. Be, 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 be healed. Be healed. Be healed. All pain subside now. All, All pain, pain subside now. now. Do not come back. Do not, Do not come, come, back. come back. Jocelyn, Jesus heals you. Jocelyn, Jocelyn Jesus, Jesus heals you. Jesus heals you. Okay, Jocelyn, get up. Try it out now. Try it out. Move in Jesus' name. Move in Jesus' name. Yeah. My my back, my back has improved. Praise the Lord. Okay. Yeah. It's improved. Only here's like, yeah. Okay. All right. So you understand how this works, right? It is a process of moving a mountain. So now yes. I am going to hand the baton over to Pastor David and the other servants of God. And you continue this, move this mountain into the sea until there is no more pain. Amen? Okay, is that okay, Jocelyn? Amen. Oh, I'm going to Thank ask you. <laughs> your most God. Yes, praise, praise the Lord. You're most welcome. My, my pleasure, my privilege. Okay, yes. Pastor David, you're in charge okay. now. You lead the soldiers. You lead the troops. Get rid of this enemy. <laughs> Vanquish this enemy. Throw him into Amen. the sea. All praise right. the Lord. Okay. Thank you, Pastor William. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise God. First so, case. All right. Refresh our, our, our learning. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. So I will, Pastor David, I'm going to make you the host. Okay. And then oh, I will I will okay. sign off. I will sign off. Yeah. Let me see. Okay. Give, me, give me a moment. So en enjoy your breakfast with your beloved Thank wife you. and uh, children, grandchildren. <laughs> yes, we will. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor William. Oh, thank, thank you. You are most welcome. You are most welcome. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to 